Resurgent is the name of the book, How Constitutional Conservatism Can Save America is the subtitle, and Ken Klukowski is the co-author along with Ken Blackwell. Mr. Klukowski joins us here at Liberty University on Book TV on C-SPAN 2. Mr. Klukowski, what do you mean when you say constitutional conservative, conservatism, and what are some of the keys to constitutional conservatism? Well, Peter, constitutional conservatism is the form of government given to us by our founding fathers. It was unique and unprecedented when they did it in the late 1700s. And it has, over two centuries and change, made America the most successful, uh, most wealthy, most prosperous, most powerful, and most free nation in all the history of world history, the history of humanity uh, worldwide. And what we do in Resurgent is we look at what it is that makes the American constitutional system different from what we can find anywhere else on the planet. Uh, both the, the tenfold promise that we get into of the Declaration of Independence, which was our founding charter, and then the Constitution of the United States with its amendments, which are the supreme law of the land. And from those, those ten principles, we draw out eight keys for a sovereign society, dealing with economic issues, social issues, uh, security issues, defense and national security, and also philosophical issues about the role of the individual, the role of the family, and the role of government to, as the founders saw it, to try and create as much as is possible with imperfect human beings to create the optimal system of government that maximizes happiness and freedom and prosperity for us all. What are some of those eight keys? The first three, I think, you list are economic keys. That's right. Uh, the issue economically is, first of all, that in order to be sovereign, uh, sovereign in our own lives, meaning not living by the leave of another, it's an issue of being able to own. Uh, you know, we came from a system where, under the British system, the crown had ultimate title to all land. Everyone from a peasant to a nobleman ultimately lived by the leave of the crown and in later years of the parliament. Uh, now, of course, the, the, the British system is caught up to us in a number of regards, but that's what it was in terms of the founders' conception. So it was an issue of ownership. You need to be able to own your own home. You need to be able to own your own land, your own education, your own retirement. The things that are essential, either on a day-to-day -day basis, like food and clothing, and also long-term, uh, a place to, to live, to shelter your family, and to prepare for your later years, that's something that you need to be able to have some measure of control over. Also, it's an issue of, of jobs, and jobs not on the individual level, and this also comes in with regulation and taxation because the issue is being able to, to take in and accumulate wealth. And of course, in accumulating wealth, there's two parts to that. One is income, and the other is, is reducing the outflow of cash through taxes, through regulations, and through cost of living. So the issue is focus, focusing on the family as the basic unit of the economy rather than individuals, with an unmarried adult being essentially a family of one. And so we look at, we look at the tax system. We propose a family-based flat tax. Uh, we, we talk about not just personal finance, but governmental finance, a balanced budget to the U.S. Constitution, which we deal with in detail later on in Resurgent, plays into those sovereign keys. So economically, in terms of being able to accumulate wealth and being able to pass that on to the next generation. Why do you say that our democratic republic is hanging by a thread? Well, we have seen abuses over the past few years that are absolutely unprecedented. The reality is it is the nature of government, and the founders understood this. This is why our constitutional system was designed to counteract this. It is the nature of government to expand because it is human nature to try and increase control. And when you give any group of human beings power over other human beings, just naturally over time, either deliberately or just through not self-checking, uh, that power tends to grow and expand. Over the past few years, however, we've seen challenges of a nature that we have never seen before. Just in previous weeks, we've seen uh, an unprecedented mandate being put on, on people of faith and institutions of faith having to carry health care services for things that are fundamentally 
uh, incompatible with their religious beliefs. Uh, we've also seen in recent months the president exercising this president, exercising what he calls his recess appointment power, which is in the Constitution so that for Senate confirmed positions, if the Senate is out, remember that was written in a time where for half of the year Congress was not in session, uh, that a president would be able to fill needful positions, uh, urgent needs, immediate needs for which uh, that would normally require Senate confirmation. Here we had a case where the Senate was not even in recess. Most of them were out for a few days, but they were still holding daily sessions. But he said, I am declaring them in recess and appointed people, some, some of whom, some nominations, which were certainly not time sensitive, had just been made a matter of days before and had not even gone through the normal vetting process. Whether it's that or the czars or the big legislative issues that we've all heard about, uh, whether it is an $800 billion stimulus plan, whether it's running deficits over a trillion dollars, all of these are fundamentally unsustainable. Or in terms of, of, of affirmative public policy, laws like Obamacare, for the first time in American history, imposing a mandate upon each American citizen in terms of something that they must do, that they must go out and buy with their own money. You know, during the last massive or one of the last massive expansions of governmental power in the 1930s, uh, FDR looked at something that would have involved uh, a, uh, an individual mandate and his legal counsel advised him they couldn't do that because it would be unconstitutional. They were right then, and, and FDR took a more restrained course. Uh, this president, uh, as we discuss in Resurgent, this president and many politicians in this current age are, are just are, are running roughshod over limits that the Constitution places on their power with the idea that the Constitution, by restraining governmental power, you're giving the people time to breathe. You're giving the people space to live, to live their own lives, to make their own decisions. And we've never seen in our history uh, government power being asserted to the lengths that it has been over the past few years. That's why we say that our constitutional system is really hanging by a thread. Have Republicans been better in your view than Democrats? Many Republicans have been better than, uh, than most Democrats on it, but one of the chapters we have in the book, and this is something that did not make us friends in some circles, you know, there are a lot of people that like to say, yeah, Republicans good, Democrats bad, you know, a straight partisan take. Uh, we have, of course, a chapter where we say uh, that half the time, uh, Republicans, many Republicans have been, especially many establishment Republicans, have been part of the problem rather than part of the solution. So this is not an issue of one party versus another. This is an issue of the philosophy of constitutional conservatism, adhering to the principles and the requirements of the U.S. Constitution. We believe the Republican Party could be a vehicle for that, and we think there are champions of constitutional conservatism within the Republican Party, but the Republican Party itself is not the answer. It can just be a vehicle to help deliver that solution if, if and only if we elect the right people. And in fact, Ken Klukowski, you write in Resurgent, President <coughs> George W. Bush was called a conservative, though as we have already seen, the former president was not. Many people may be conservative in several specific areas, but shouldn't be called conservatives. Well, President Bush, we have great respect for so much of what President Bush did, and many things that he did were, were indeed conservative, and, and many of his actions, uh, many of his appointments also were conservative. But certainly, uh, whether it's No Child Left Behind, whether it's uh, Medicare uh, Part D, the prescription benefit plan, uh, th these are massive expansions of either federal control or of federal funding. And, uh, and those, are not, those are not in and of themselves uh, conservative. At the same time, President Bush did speak about the need to foster an ownership society, uh, spoke about the need for people to be able to, to have control through individualized accounts, increasing control of Social Security, Medicare, so that they could manage their own retirements, manage their own health care, and all of those are conservative ideas. How does a gun debate figure in or the gun issue figure into a uh, resurgent? Well, we have a whole chapter on, on the Second Amendment. My co-author is on the board of directors of the National Rifle Association and I am a former employee and contractor uh, for the NRA as well. Also, some of my legal scholarly works are on the Second Amendment. 
Uh, we have seen an emergence of a jurisprudence on the Second Amendment in the past few years. There had been a debate.